it's a, um, it's a, um, it's, it's about time to uh, get started with our with our talks again. Um, and um, you know, sorry about the display. I was trying to hide the Windows taskbar, but I haven't used Windows for so many years that I don't know how to do it anymore. Um, I, I can't make it go away. So that bottom strip of the screen uh, seems to be blocked. Um, so um, um, so uh, so for uh, you know, for those of you who am I meeting for the first time, um, I'm Li Ping Wang. I'm an assistant professor at UC Davis and one of the um, academic uh, collaborators in this open force field initiative. Um, and today I would like to tell you about the, uh, the strategy that we use to optimize the parameters in our, um, in, in our, in our first um, release of the optimized force field. And before I begin, um, I want to say that this, uh, um, that this was really made, um, um, made possible with, uh, you know, with, um, with effort and assistance from everyone in the collaboration, but in particular, the three individuals that I'm showing on the screen here. So Yu Dong Cho from my group, um, Simon Boothroyd, who is a, um, who's a postdoctoral fellow supported by ExcelPy and is in John Cordera's lab, and Daniel Smith, a software scientist with, uh, with Molsi, um, who, um, um, who not only have um, really gone above and beyond in terms of the efforts they contributed, but they also came up with many you know, um, original and very innovative ideas that I think really made the difference between this working and not working. Um, so, uh, so without any further ado, um, we can uh, we, we can start. Some of this will partially overlap with what um, with what uh, David um, gave in his introductory talk because that kind of laid the foundation for everything that we're going to be talking about in the rest of the day. So, um, so, so basically, uh, as of this week, um, um, our first major um, our fir our first major round of parameter optimization is is complete. That's not to say we're not going to do any more optimization and corrections, but we've now reached a point where we can start doing some really extensive testing and benchmarking and getting community feedback from, from what we're doing. So the, um, so the current version of the optimized force field available online is, um, we're going to call that our first release candidate. Um, the, previous, uh, you know, the previous rounds of optimized results are, are, are also online. Um, we're just not you know, encouraging that you use the early ones. Uh, you know, use this. Um, there's a numerical versioning scheme that Jeff referred to. So, X is the major release, Y is like a minor release, and Z is a bug fix release. Um, and then, um, and we're also giving these releases a uh, code names. And one reason why we're why we're calling the first the release Parsley is that we're hoping we can make it to four major releases, and then we could have a Parsley, Sage, Rosemary, and Pine. Which is a, yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, um, so let me uh, summarize the um, the optimized uh, parameters of the force field and the data that went into optimization kind of added questions. So first, um, which parameters were optimized? Um, we, uh, um, we, looked at the, um, we looked at bond stretching and angle bending, equilibrium parameters, and force constants. Um, the number of parameters is listed up there. Um, we, also looked at, uh, we also looked at barrier heights in the, um, in the torsions. So, um, so to be clear, we did not optimize the phases in the torsions, and we did not add any new barriers that were not already there. Um, which means that if uh, in, in, the, in the starting force field, if it was one fold, then it stayed one fold. We didn't add any two fold or three fold terms to a, a, you know, to a torsion term that was, um, that was originally one fold. There's also a total of 30 Leonard Jones sigma and epsilon parameters, so 15 sigma and 15 epsilons that were optimized for a total of 530. Um, so one of the, so one of the um, um, I guess, uh, um, one of the arguments that we made for the, um, for one of the advantages of the Smirnoff format from you know from very early on, is that this really um, um, is that this really gives you a very uh, compressed representation of a small molecule force field, and that in that the number of independent parameters is a lot smaller compared to the um, indirect chemical perception that uses atom types. Yeah. Um, uh, like, um, oh, you mean how many atom types do we have in here? Um, no, no atom types. There, there are there, there are Leonard there are Leonard Jones types which um, which um, which I guess serve some of the same purposes as atom types, but they're not used to assign the bond of parameters. Um, all right. Um, yes. In in your optimization, you optimize you optimize everything at once. Yeah. 
Um, in the um, protocol for optimization, do you optimize everything at the same time? Or, for example, if, if Leonard Jones are optimized separately, then you'd have 30 parameters and roughly 60 observables. Um, that's, a, um, that, that's an important question. The answer is coming up. Uh, sh um, short, short answer, we, we did iterate back and forth between bonded and non-bonded just, just once. This time, we did not fully co-optimize them just because we ran out of time, but it's something we want to do. Um, all right, so at a, um, again, at a, um, kind of at a glance, what, um, what data did we use to parameterize the force field? Um, um, we, used a, um, we used both um, data from ab initio calculations as, as well as experimental data and to, uh, and to generate and curate this data, um, um, there, there was a lot of uh, effort that went into this. So, um, so you don't primarily did the QM data um, generation working closely with Daniel Smith, who created and maintains the QC archive ecosystem. And, um, and, Simon, um, and, and Simon was uh, um, carried out the experimental data curation by pulling the information out of the thermal ML archive. Um, so for, um, um, so for the so valence uh, so the valence parameters are are uh, are informed by um, um, by ab initio optimized geometries and calculated vibrational frequencies. There's a total of about um, there's almost 1,800 optimized structures and 900 sets of frequencies. Um, and then the um, and then the torsion parameters are informed by these um, by these torsion drives. These are basically energy versus torsion angle profiles of constrained optimized PM geometries. Everybody here is more or less a uh, um, familiar with these, and then um, and then for Leonard Jones, we're going to look at the density and heat of vaporization of molecular liquids. This is sort of um, you're just taking the the historical cue of what was done to optimize the OPLS parameters back in the day, and we have a total of 39 liquid densities and 19 peaks of vaporization for use. Okay, um, so um, um, and then uh, just at a glance again, how are the parameters optimized? Um, first, we have to describe the starting point. So we started from Smirnoff 99 frost. Um, which were the parameters that Christopher Bailey adopted from um, basically for maximal, uh, you know, closeness to Amber 99 and permafrost, and then um, um, and the parameters are optimized by this uh, regular regularized nonlinear least squares procedure, which is implemented into the force balance software um, developed in my group, and then um, and the parameters were optimized in three major stages. This uh, um, this answers Arnie's question. That we first fitted all of the valence and torsion parameters to the QM calculation, then we froze those parameters, and then Simon optimized the Leonard Jones parameters to reproduce the thermodynamic properties, and then we froze those parameters, and then we re-optimized the, um, the bonded parameters again, and then that's where we said we had our release candidate. Okay. Um, and then um, here is the current location of the optimized parameters, the fitting data, and optimization output. We actually, uh, we actually forked it over from my group repository to the more official open force field repository. So this link needs to be updated now. Um, so the force field is provided in the OFF XML format. You can use it for simulations uh, um, right away. And, uh, and, um, and, this, and this repository includes really detailed release notes for each, uh, for each, param for each parameterization, which, um, which kind of shows our, our thought processes in getting to the point where we are now. And then the downloadable files includes not only the parameters, but a lot of really detailed information about the optimization. So how well does our, does our current parameter set perform for each single torsion, you know, each single optimized geometry, each parameter, you can find all of that information in there. Um, okay, so, um, um, so this is just a, um, um, a, a version of our software component and data flow diagram and the parts in green are uh, what I'm going to be talking about. So the parameter optimizer is going to take information and um, take quantum chemical information from the QC archive. Um, it's also going to uh, um, it's also going to incorporate experimental properties and the differences between simulated properties and experimental properties. And we're relying on Simon's uh, property estimator toolkit to do that. And then after the optimization, we you know, end up with an optimized force field, and eventually we get to the new release that we have today. Um, so, um, um, so, at, so at some point along our thought process, we had to decide on a QM level of theory. And then um, and here we're mainly going to be talking about QM levels of theory for conformational energies because that's what the, um, 
because I, I would, um, because arguably the, the torsion drives are the most important um, QM calculations that, that we that we are doing in this in this step, and um, and and um, and an important component of the torsion drive, not the only component, are um, relative conformational energies, and there are a few conformational energy benchmarks in the literature. There actually aren't that many, but here are two that um, that we decided were were done were done quite carefully, where they compared conformational energies from various DFT functionals. They compared it to you know, high level coupled cluster reference. And there was kind of a surprising result um, that, um, that, there are, that, that there exist um, small basis sets, so a double zeta basis set published in, the, published in the 90s that give you very close accuracy in conformational energy compared to a much larger uh, tr like um, triple zeta basis set that all it's published much later. Um, and we're going to be using a you know, pretty well established um, global hybrid uh, density functional MP3 LIP with uh, with Grimna's B3 um, you know with uh, correction, um, and then um, and for and for conformational energies, this is we're going to we basically decided this was this was sufficient for the the generation of our of our data set. Um, and in keeping with uh, um, in keeping with with precedent, we are um, we are cal carrying out these calculations by gas phase. Although I think it's a very interesting and important discussion whether we want to do future calculations. With implicit solvent. Uh, so, which molecules did we choose? Uh, David alluded to this. Um, so, we started with uh, we started with 468 small molecules provided by uh, by Roche and um, and uh, Xavier Lucas, our our contact at, at Roche. So, really thankful for those. Um, and then, um, and from these molecules, we identified 820 rotatable bonds involving four heavy atoms that are not in rings. So, those are like the most candidate, uh, most obvious candidates for torsion drives. Um, and then because we're doing these in the gas phase, we don't really want our fitting to be, uh, to be contaminated by the formation of strong um, intramolecular non-bonded interactions, such as hydrogen bonds. So we filtered out the torsion drives where there were strong intra intramolecular hydrogen bonds, and, that, uh, and then we ended up with uh, 669. Um, and, then, um, and then there was another set of molecules, the coverage set. I didn't know as much about this set, so I don't have a pic I don't have pictures of those molecules in this talk, but David did. Um, and this uh, this coverage set um, ensures um, basically ensures like almost full coverage of the Smirnoff parameters, and it leads to 417 more torsion drives. I think when we fully assess the coverage of the parameters, we got 481 out of 500 parameters right that were that, that were covered by the um, by the coverage set, and then. Um, um, and then, um, and, and then we performed um, energy minimizations of these to get, um, to get local minima. There was actually a conformer generation um, step in here, although I'm not sure what exactly what conformer generation procedure was used. So, um, um, so even though we don't have 1,785 molecules, that's how many local minima we have. Um, and then we are going to tweak the force field parameters so that our minimized structures are as close as possible to the QM local minima. That's actually precisely what um, what Jeff did in his demo, right? <laughs> um, so so that so that is one of the things that we're doing here. And then at the lowest energy minimum, we're going to do the frequency calculations, and we are going to match the vibrational frequencies as well. Um, so um, um, so I'll just uh, um, briefly uh, plug the QC archive project that Daniel is going to go into um, a lot more a lot more detail. This is basically a um, this is a um, this is a you know, quantum chemistry uh, computation um, environment where um, where it will basically organize all of your calculations and also figure out you know where are the uh, where are the cloud resources to run your calculations and it's really great for organizing large data sets such as the ones that we need for fitting our force field parameters um, and then um, and then so um, so the so the calculations um, done um, are going to be done in this ecosystem so so QC archive is going to be running our calculation. Um, and so, what QC Archive actually executes at um, at kind of a high level is that it calls this uh, it calls this torsion drive method. And torsion drive is a uh, um, torsion drive is a method that does this recursive wavefront propagation of these constrained energy optimizations. The prob the reason why we are doing this is that you know that if you uh, you know that if you do a sequence of constrained energy minimizations, you can get hysteresis, uh, where um, where you might you know fall onto uh, um, kind of a different branch of the potential energy surface where you have reorganization of your orthogonal degrees of freedom. And the thinking was that um, 
if you um, if you ever if you ever run into you know if you ever cross between these branches of the potential energy surface, you might be able to step back and then do and then um, um, and then do some constrained energy minimizations in the other direction and end up with some lower energy geometries. So this was implemented in this recursive fashion, and that's essentially what torsion drive is. And then um, um, and then because we need these constrained energy minimizations. Um, um, torsion drive is going to then um, is is then going to uh, call a software package called a package called geometric for geometry optimizing. So every quantum chemistry package has an internal geometry optimizer. Geometric is a little bit different. It's an external geometry optimizer that calls um, that basically calls um, any code you want for the energies and gradients, and it contains the internal coordinate system for the geometry optimization. Um, we found a, you know, we're pleasantly surprised that it's pretty robust in these constraint optimizations because QC Archive has run more than 200,000 of, of these, and um, and we haven't had a single convergence error. Um, and um, and and QC Archive is also going to implement the other types of optimizations that we need, such as a unconstrained geometry optimization and and the Hessian calculations, which are going to give us our bond and angle force constants. And then um, and then once these calculations are finished on QC Archive. It's only a matter of some scripting to download all of the calculations and convert them into a format that force balance can read. Okay, um, and now let's talk about the selection of experimental data. This is what um, um, this is what Simon did. I just I just took all of his smile strings and pasted it into ChemDraw. This is how I um, how I made this figure. Um, so these are the molecules that had the thermodynamic property data that we identified from ThermoML. So um, hmm. So the so the black ones they have both density and heat of, and heat of vaporization. The red ones have density only, and the blue ones have heat of vaporization only. Um, should point out that ThermoML only can, only covers data that's published in the in the last ten years. So a lot of the older data is actually um, is actually not in there. But we think this problem will become less serious when we move to um, thermodynamic properties of mixtures, where you know, ThermoML really has a very copious data on on mixtures. Um, yeah, for for now, we're going to focus on small compounds with uh, with good parameter coverage, and um, and our selected set of molecules covers 15 out of 35 Smirnoff non-bonded types. And even though this doesn't seem like too much, it's actually quite a bit because out of the ones that we don't cover, a lot of them are um, a lot of them are things like uh, um, like like ions or in HCl, HBr, and um, and and things like this. So the 15 out of 35 types that we're optimizing, um, I I think it actually covers. A fairly good uh, uh, swath of chemical space, um, and then um, and then to do this optimization, we use this um, we use this force balance tool, and um, and because I've um, because I've given these slides before, maybe I'll go through this a little bit um, a little bit more quickly. There's basically a Python toolkit that carries out this nonlinear optimization of the parameters for you. It handles the construction of the objective function that represents the the amount of disagreement between your force field predictions. And the um, um, and the reference data, and it automates the execution of the molecular mechanics code to you know to, to calculate your energies, your minimized geometries, or to run your simulations. Um, well, now it calls property estimator to run the simulation. Um, and then um, um, and then um, one one thing that one feature of force balance is that um, is that it can um, is that it can handle um, I guess a uh, Force field parameters that will often obey like relationships, such as uh, um, such as you know you might you you might want some parameters to sum up to zero, or you might want other parameters to not change sign, um, just because they represent physical quantities. They can't just be anything. Um, so um, so force balance has uh, implements this mapping between the unconstrained optimization variables and the physical force field parameters, um, and so. Um, and so, because there is this, uh, because there's this mapping, you can basically, um, you can basically make the optimization obey any kind of constraint you want uh, in in your in your parameter space. Um, so, because uh, because time is limited, I'm not going to uh, go into this into too much detail. But if you want to, um, but if you want to learn about basically how the objective function is constructed, it's um, I've laid it out pretty carefully. Okay. Um, so, um, so what did we do that was new in the past um, in the past few months? So, in order to um, in order to enable this parameter optimization, we had to implement you know new terms in the objective function. Um, so the optimized geometry target is a um, the optimized geometry target is new, um, and the way it works is that it will uh, match the molecular mechanics optimized structure to the QM optimized structure 
And in order to do this matching, it first decomposes the structure into the internal coordinates. And the objective function is calculated from the sum of square differences in the internal coordinates. In particular, we focus on bonds, angles, and improper torsions because for the torsion degrees of freedom, that's what the torsion charts are for. Um, and, then, um, and, then, and then we have a new torsion profile target. Um, this, uh, um, this new target was, um, um, it really take, it, it actually takes the, what we were doing before is that we were fitting um, MM single point energies to these PM torsion energy profiles. But Christopher Bailey pointed out during one of our meetings that when you actually run a simulation, the molecular mechanics structures will largely relax. And then that will, and, and then that will give you in practice a very different profile than that single point profile that you fitted. So this new torsion profile target is going to carry out a restrained molecular mechanics minimization prior to comparing the M energies to the QM energies. Um, and, um, and, that's, and that's how we are going to fit all of our, um, all of our torsion charts. And in, the, um, and, and in the third part, there was an existing vibrational frequency target, but we weren't able to calculate the frequencies in OpenMM before, but this is, uh, um, but this is implemented now. So, um, um, so, um, so, so Yudong and I basically, uh, um, we, we divided these tasks among the three of us, and now we can do this. Yes. The the the, tor the torsion atoms are frozen. Yeah, like um, it is uh, it is in principle possible um, to use a package like geometric and actually freeze the torsion angle and relax everything else. But that optimization is much more expensive, and we're doing millions of these optimizations in every optimiz in every cycle of the parameter optimization. So there, so there is a, so there is sort of an approximate component to this freezing of the torsion. Um, all right, and then, um, um, and then as for the, um, as for the thermodynamic properties, um, we decided to, um, to use uh, the the property estimator toolkit that um, that Simon developed. He's going to tell you more about that. Um, and because, um, and so this is a toolkit for simulating physical properties, and it, it, and we basically use that as a drop-in replacement. For the for the codes that were you know native to force balance for calculating properties and the advantage is that this is going to give us a platform for improved performance and improved methods in the you know in the future because there's lots of innovative statistical mechanical methods to estimate these properties more rapidly as we go towards future releases. Um, so Yudong and Simon work together to create this force balance and property estimator interface. For force balance asks property estimator for the properties. Um, and it also asks for the, um, the gradients of the properties with respect to the parameters. Property estimator hands these back, and the force balance will build the objective function and its associated gradients, and then run the optimization that way. Um, and so the basic way of the basic workflow of using force balance is that you first set the parameters that you want to optimize in the force field file. You um, you set up your target folders that contain um, that contain you know the the data that you want the force field to be fitted to. And then you create this input file that specifies your calculations, uh, calculation settings, and then we, and then you run and wait for the results. Um, and then, um, and so now we can start talking a little bit, bit about the results. So um, I said that the the optimization was run in three main stages, and here's the convergence behavior of the three stages. So, um, so in the first stage, we um, um, we are fitting to only um, QM properties, uh, and then, and you and you can see that um, that that most of the decrease in the objective function happens in the first iteration. And by the fifth iteration, things are only changing by, by one or 2%. So our convergence criteria are met by the 14th iteration or so. And then that's when we went to the second stage. And in the second stage, because you're calculating thermodynamic properties, there's, an amount, there's some amount of statistical noise. That means the objective function can't converge as precisely as when you were fitting to the QM properties. And so in the second stage, you see things go up and down a bit. And you basically have to terminate that manually because it's hard to define the perfect convergence criteria for that. And then after we freeze the Leonard-Jones parameters from, from here, we, um, um, we, we fit to the QM properties again, and that gives us the blue points here. And we end up with an objective function that is just very slightly higher than the objective function that we got from stage one. Okay. Um, and, um, and so here is a um, so here is a graph that describes the quality of fit for the torsion profile. So let me explain a little bit what this um, what this graph really means. Um, so here the um, so here on the on the x axis each point on the x axis is one torsion profile, and the gray curve 
is the starting value of the objective function. The red curve is the optimized value of the objective function. And I've sorted them in decreasing order of the optimized objective function. So first, what you see is that the red curve is generally lower than the gray curve, which is expected because we're optimizing the objective function. But sometimes the gray curve is below the red curve, which means that this optimization does not uniformly improve every single Horton value. Some of them, like most of them get better, but some of them get worse. And furthermore, it's um, um, the starting value of the objective function is not a very good predictor of the final value of the, of the objective function. And in fact, I think there's probably a lot of, um, a lot of fine details going on here in why some certain portions are easier to fit and others are harder. Um, if we take, you know, a more, if we take a closer look at like individual torsion profiles, you can see that some of them are fitted, you know, very, very well, like on the left, the molecule on the left, whereas the molecule on the right is, you know, is not quite looking as good. Um, sometimes, um, um, sometimes this might, this might have to do with, um, say, a particular torsion type is applied to multiple molecules, but the torsion profile for these multiple molecules are very different, so you might need to add an extra parameter type in, and so, for the, and so for the cases that are not looking as optimal, those are just things that we'll continue to study in the future. Um, as for, yes. Is there, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice right now. Are you guys doing any uh, training test uh, splits on these uh, torsional group profiles? Um, we're not doing training test splits right now, but I guess, um, um, I guess that was, um, we were, I guess that's kind of what the I guess that's kind of what the validation is for, and maybe one reason why we're not doing the splits right now is because um, is because our our set of molecules um, does not cover our parameters that many times. It's like for example, if our if if our molecules covered each of our parameters a hundred times, then I'd be more comfortable doing a training test split. Yeah. yeah, and I would also say that we have lots of additional calculations that we haven't used for fitting yet that we're waiting, that we're going to be testing on. So. Okay. Um, you're, it seems to me you're doing yourself a bit of a disservice because the scale on the right one is larger than the left one, so the errors aren't as bad as they look. But I'm curious, it seems that on optimization, the fit got worse. On the right, um, I think I, I think it got slightly worse. Yeah. How could that happen? Well, it could it could happen if the same torsion type is actually assigned to two different molecules. Oh. And what optimization procedure did you use? Um, oh, I uh, truss radius Newton Raphson. It's a truss radius Newton Raphson. Thanks. I haven't looked at this much, so maybe I'm missing something. But I mean, there's an arbitrary vertical offset that one could apply, right? So if you, I mean, presumably, if you, you know, the most dominant state would be the energy global minimum. If you align those, I mean, the, one might get a different impression. So how did I just? What's the metric of? Yeah, because uh, it looks like it looks like the peaks are aligned, or those two subsidiary peaks almost. Um, yeah, that, that's that's totally true. Yeah, you, oh. you um, yeah. So you so you have to make a choice in, in how you align things and. And we align all of the curves to the lowest energy structure in the QF. And the reason why we did that is that if you end up with a if you end up with an MM curve that has a different lowest energy structure compared to in the QF, then it will show up as a as having a, a negative energy on that on that y-axis. And that is an indicator that when you run the simulation, you could end up with an incorrect equilibrium distribution. But what's happened here, at least sort of quirkily, is that You've got them aligned on that QM energy minimum, but it, but it's the MM one is shifted off to the right. So it's almost as though if you allowed a little bit of phase shifting or something, you know, slop, then suddenly it might all come together better. It might um, even optimize better. Um, yeah, that, that's uh, that's um, so that's so that's true. I mean, the, um, um, the the way we've aligned things right now is also kind of the the way the optimizer sees it. So um, so if um, so if so if in this alignment, MM is lower than QM anywhere and the QM energy is low, then, then it receives you know, basically the maximum weight of the, the objective function. Um, but, um, but yeah, you're, 
um, you're right. If the green curve, if the green curve were, were shifted upward, then we would see that, um, that basically the difference between the green and the blue is that the minima seem to be shifted inward by about a minute. Right, right, which might be preferable to this. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess, um, um, yeah, that, that, that's true. I'm not, I, I'm, um, the, the way of aligning these, these curves is definitely not, you know, like said and done. There, there, might, be, there might be different ways to do it. Um, um, but this, uh, but this way of using the lowest energy structure in the QM is how I've done it for, um, a, a, I guess at least a couple of years. But there, um, but I haven't. Um, but but there could be diff different ways to do it. Thank you. For the purpose of an MD simulation, you actually care about the uh, the uh, heights of the barriers relative to the lowest uh, uh, states, right? So the optimized. Uh, Oh wait, never mind. I'm reading it wrong. So it actually flipped. Sorry, that's actually going to be uh, be quite bad be because the mi minima actually changed to a different uh, phase. It seems, yeah, yeah. So so the barriers actually got quite high there. I just mi I misread the uh, the the plot. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think that when you just have like a few hundred pro organ profiles, some of them get better, some of them get worse. You can always you, you know I could I could pick maybe like a hundred plots that look like the one on the left. I could also pick maybe 10 that look like the one on the right. And then the, and then the ones on the right are always going to make us kind of you know, uncomfortable, right? But I, think, but I think every time the optimization actually makes an individual, you know, makes an individual torsion profile worse, that, prob that, that probably just means that there, um, that, there, that there might be like a certain periodicity that we're not including in the parameter type or that one parameter type may, might need to be split into two. Um, and I know we have discussed this point before, but um, if we could, um, since it's not possible to do um, uh, um, PMFs um, with a quantum uh, wave func with a quantum um, description, a quantum a Q, a quantum chemistry description of the molecule, it's too expensive. Um, it would be nice to have a set of charges that you felt re reflected the gas phase um, so that you could be fitting the torsion profiles um, to a, a gas phase um, and therefore mimic more what the quantum chemistry calculations are. Uh, we, we looked at this a little bit um, and uh, determined some uh, solution phase um, uh, charges and then um, uh, through quantum chemistry calculations, um, and then went back and from the gas phase, um, determined um, charges um, that were used in the fitting of the torsion profiles. That's so, so that's just a comment. I'm still not um, really happy with that. I'd really like to do PMFs with the um, quantum chemistry, um, but it may be something to think about. Yeah, um, yeah, so the... Um the the I the IPOL Q system is is definitely you know um, um, like is like definitely has that um, has that physical like this physically grounded idea that, that that in the gas phase your you know your charges are going to be different compared to when you actually run the simulation um, another um, another possibility I've been toying around um, you know, just just thinking about is whether um, um, is whether it might be possible to do both the QM and MM calculations with some implicit solvent model. And I think some people have started to do this as well. Yes, and so I'm going to make one more comment. Um, uh, I don't think we should rely on an implicit solvent model for water. Water, hydrogen bonds, okay. right? And um, I'm quite, uh, I'm okay with using it for organic solvents. Um, benzene, dichloromethane, things like that. But I am very um, concerned about using it for water. I am still a little bit confused on the right-hand side plot. What are you aligning for the relative energies? I, I really don't get that, sorry. So this, this point here, is the, this is the lowest energy structure in the QM. Mm -hmm. And so every and and so every curve has that energy um, subtracted from every from from each of the points. So that's where so all of the three curves are are crossing. When it's a yeah right yeah right so, all, all three curves <clears throat> you subtract the energy of the of 
you subtract the energy of the lowest energy structure in the QM. Is that really a relative energy? Um, well, I guess I, I guess the way I I guess one way I, I interpret it is this: um, if you were if you if you could do sampling in the QM, you're probably going to get um, an equilibrium distribution that's centered around minus seventy five degrees and maybe like plus seventy five degrees. Whereas if you um, whereas if you do the sampling in the MM, it might actually predict your you know like parts of your equilibrium your equilibrium distribution to be around negative 165 degrees. And, and I think that when we look at force field errors, the zeroth order error is the equilibrium distribution. And then only after we get that right, should we pay a lot of attention to the big errors. So, so but I mean, another, another, this is just really off the cuff, it would be totally wrong. But another way of comparing would be to get it like a Jensen-Shannon divergence between the probability density functions that correspond to these. So that would allow for some lateral shift and in some sense, it would give you what you really want, which is the distribution. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a, I haven't thought about that before. Me neither. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think that I, I, I think that um, I, I think that has a pretty good chance of I think that has a pretty good chance of working. Um, um, yeah, like I, I guess when it comes to you know um, relative probabilities of structures, um, I find that when you get to like maybe five or six kT, the you know the um, um, well, like, I'm, I might, it might be needed to use an elevated temperature, but I, but I think, but I think that exactly. concept sounds really nice. Um, yeah, so I, I guess uh, maybe, um, um, is, it, is it okay to keep going? I know we're a little over. Uh, let's see, I have torsion profiles, optimized geometries, vibrational frequencies, thermodynamic properties, changes in parameters. That's it. <laughs> um, oh, sure, sure. Yeah, well, so the optimized, ge um, so optimized geometries and vibrational frequencies, we can go over these um, kind, of, kind of quickly. So, you, so, you, so, here, so here again is the, um, is the plot that shows you that, um, that, that here, you know, for the vast majority of cases, um, fitting to the optimized geometries really does, uh, you know, really does improve the objective function. And then here is the more detailed analysis of exactly what happens. So here, so let me explain how to, um, how to read these plots. Um, the, the scatter plots that you see there, you see an orange one and a blue one. These are, um, um, these are, these are MM, these are, these are MM minimized um, internal, these are MM minimized like bond lengths versus QM minimized bond lengths for the initial parameters in orange and the optimized parameters in blue. If the force field was perfectly accurate, then everything would be on the dotted line. Um, and because the force field only has one equilibrium parameter, because we're grouping by bond type, that's represented by the vertical line here. So on the, so on the left panel, you can see that the original equilibrium bond length parameter is in orange, and the new equilibrium bond length parameter is a lot larger. Um, and then after the optimization, you can see that the points start to cluster a lot closer to the diagonal line, which means that this is a, that this is a positive result. But you can also see that by optimizing the valence parameters, we are not really able to control the distribution in the in the energy minimized bond lengths of the same bond type because we um, because we don't see these uh, we don't see these actually collapsing to the diagonal line. It's more like the cluster moves over to the diagonal line, and then there are also um, and then there are also cases where the spread in the QM optimized bond lengths is a lot larger, meaning, and, that, and, and that's when our optimization of the valence parameters isn't able to improve things by all that much. Th those are cases where we might want to, you know, um, rely on like maybe automatically identifying new bond types or maybe using bond orders to interpolate between bond types. That's, a, that's some, really, uh, some really promising stuff. And here you can see an example of, um, of, of an angle type that was a, uh, you know, that was assigned to several angles and molecules where the QM, um, where some of the QM and MM minimized angles are around 130, but other ones were around 100 or are around 110 or 115. Um, so this is kind of an example where, um, especially when it comes to the case of angles, there can be a lot of, um, there can actually be a lot of frustration in the angle terms at the minimized structure. 
in the sense that the minimized value of the angle might actually be pretty far from the equilibrium angle parameter. And that's, uh, and that's definitely worth some uh, food for thought. Okay, um, for vibrational frequencies, I think we can go through this a little bit more quickly. Um, here you can see the objective function decreases even more, um, even more dramatically. And, and moreover, the initial value of the objective function seems to not vary by too much across the, you know, across the different molecules. And if you look at the, uh, if you look at the performance in the computed versus, um, you, you know, the MM versus QM vibrational modes, you can see that most of the uh, most of the error in the objective function comes from a few outliers in the, you know, in the high like 1,000 to 2,000 range. And, op and after optimizing the valence parameters, things fall a lot closer to the diagonal line. So we think we're doing okay for the vibrational frequencies. I should mention that we still want to move to internal coordinate Hessians, and that just didn't quite make the cut this year, and we're, and we're going to do that soon. Yeah. Um, I, think there's, I think there should be OH stretches. Yeah. Um, you mean, um, like, uh, so OH stretch would be up here. Um, and, and I think some of those improve, but maybe the biggest improvement is this. Yeah, I, I, I don't know exactly what that is. Yeah, it um, could, could be an angle. When I was putting this plot together, I didn't exactly have the machinery to interrogate that particular vibration. Yeah, maybe Trevor can help me with that later. <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, and so thermodynamic properties, this is, uh, this is perhaps the most challenging one because to estimate a thermodynamic property, you need to run an entire simulation, right? So here, um, so here we, uh, we turn to uh, the property estimation toolkit to run the simulations and give us the estimated properties as well as the gradients. And on the left is the densities, on the right is heat of vaporization, and yellow is pre-optimization and blue is post-optimization. Okay, so this, um, so when you see the decrease in the objective function, you know things, you know things are getting better, but um, but you don't really know, you know, how much more accurate things are getting. And this, um, and this plot will, you know, kind of give you a sense for that. Um, so where was the original force field not performing as well? Um, uh, for example, these points here, like this very dense liquid, um, experimentally around 2,500. Theory predicts it to be up to be about 1,900. That's this uh, um, um, dibromomethane. Okay, um, and so, and so the optimization. Will uh, um, will correct the parameters for for bromine basically in order to bring the density closer to experiment. Um, as for the heats of vaporization, you also see that um, you also see that there are generally improvements, but there is kind of an outlier on the on the high side here, where even after optimization of the force field, we are getting the heat of vaporization to be too high, and this turns out to be um, to be not only a pretty polar molecule but also um, a carboxylic acid, um, and so. Um, and so um, it, it might be possible that there could be a that there that there could be some sampling issues of that carboxylic acid in the gas phase because that flipping of that of that that usual angle is just is just so rare. Okay, so that's a so that's the basic performance for thermodynamic properties. As for um, changes in in parameters, you can see that you can see that there's some variation depending on the parameter type, and that um, and, and and that's a and and sometimes that's just a function of you know certain parameters just being much more well determined, like a bond length. Um, and other times, you see, we see a lot more. We see a lot larger variations in the angle force constant. Um, that could be partially due to the relatively large prior width, or you know, relatively weak regularization that we set. Um, but um, but also, there might be larger like intrinsic uncertainties in these parameters when they were when they were initially guessed. Um, here are the changes in the parameters for the van der Waals that David already showed you, as well as the uh, as well as the of the proper torsion parameters. The proper torsion parameters are the ones that change the most, but the larger changes are on the order of three kcal per mole or so. Okay, so this uh, brings me close to the end. Um, so, uh, so in terms of outlook, the force field is ready for benchmarking and testing. Really looking forward to hearing about your results because, um, because this is just a starting point, right? We would like to use this as a good starting point to do better and better. Um, and um, in terms of some near-term development goals, there are some obvious things that we'd like to do. Um, we like to use these internal coordinate Hessians that I said we would do in January. We haven't done them yet. Um, and then, um, and for our torsion drives, uh, the Roche set included a lot of flexible rings that we didn't include that didn't really make it into this data set. So this requires a torsion drive with an energy upper limit, which is implemented now, so we can uh, so, so we can do these. Um, we're also interested in co-optimization of Leonard Jones and the bonded 
um, parameters to see if we can do even better in terms of our qualities of fit. Um, and you know, for, for our longer term goals, there's many long term goals to, to discuss. So this is not at all an inclusive list, but, um, um, but, uh, but, but for example, there might be valence degrees of uh, freedom, like, um, like say certain angles that have very large deformations that need to be explicitly scanned. Um, this is a study that we started that is currently ongoing. We're interested in, in improved charge models. Um, um, one, one potential improved charge model is the REST2 method that Michael Schauperl has developed. And then um, and we're also very interested in thermodynamic properties of mixtures in our training data set. We think that might be a lot better than using heats of vaporization because we're never really simulating things that are purely in the gas phase. Um, and then, um, and so, and so with that, I did, a, I did attempt to list uh, um, um, all of the, um, all of the folks who, uh, who contributed to, um, you know, the, um, the current work as, uh, as well as, as well as ongoing work. Um, but, um, but it's also very likely that I, um, that I left somebody out of this list. But, you know, it's been great um, I'm working with everyone so far. Um, I'm interested in hearing their uh, feedback. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah.